hello! Welcome to Changeling Cast, the podcast dedicated to reading and dissecting urban fantasy, paranormal, and speculative romance series. I'm your host, Mara, from the YouTube channel Books Like Woe, and this season we are making our way through Nalini Singh's Psy Changeling series. series which is called Visions of Heat and this one is not as iconic as the first one in my opinion Um, I don't feel like I loved it and connected with it to the same level I do still think there's a lot for us to get into in this particular one and I will say I think today's is going to end up being a pretty uh, personal episode (laughs) from me because I really just because of some of the other things that I was listening to or thinking about while I was doing this reread, I made some pretty personal introspective connections of why I think this series uh, has been such a special one in my life in the last few years. Uh, And I think because of basically a theme that I hadn't really picked up on until this particular reread. So I got about halfway through the book and I had to take a little like reflection moment. Um, I went back and read some journals from when I was first reading this series. and, And I do think that I've made some connections and unearthed another sort of, I think, series long theme that we can be looking out for as we go forward. So yeah, anyway, I did, I liked this one. And as I said, it did (laughs) inspire some pretty deep introspection for me. Um, But I do think that this one is not quite as strong as Slave to Sensation, just in terms of, I think some of the narrative tension is not present in this one. So anyway, we'll talk about it. But uh, just a reminder um, to please take a minute and rate and review the show if you are enjoying it. Thank you, everyone who has taken a chance to do that. You had some really sweet reviews. It made me very verklempt. Um, and I really appreciate people taking a moment to do that. Just a reminder that I am doing my best to have the episodes up in the podcast feed on Monday mornings. And then for those of you who like to listen slash watch on YouTube, that is up on Tuesday mornings on my booktube channel books like whoa so with that we're gonna follow roughly the same kind of overall pattern as how we kind of tackled this last time with the exception of I think I'm going to not get into as many details in the recap because I think the first book slave to sensation there was so much that was getting set up for the totality of the series and sasha and lucas are such sort of core characters in the series i think really kind of deeply diving into the actual what of the plot for that one made a lot of sense but for this one i don't know if i'll go in as much detail for the actual plot uh because i do i think i want to spend more time thinking about some of the the themes that i think this reading unearthed also warning to you guys (laughs) i think that the kitty cats are going to be in my recording room more than they normally are because they have woken up from a nap and they are demanding some attention so if you hear little pitter patters of kitty feet or little plaintive mews that make it sound like i'm ignoring them and you know depriving them of everything that they need in life that that is why they are awake and they want to play. So I guess that's appropriate enough because we are talking about an entire clan of kitty cats who are awakening Sai and wanting to play with them. Um, So this particular entry, Visions of Heat, our main characters are Faith, Nightstar, and Vaughn D'Angelo, I think is his last name. So let's start with Vaughn because we met him in Slave to Sensation. He is basically Lucas Hunter, who is the alpha of the Dark River Leopard Pack. This is his chief lieutenant. So like kind of his right hand guy. He is actually a jaguar, but he was adopted by the Dark River Pack when he was but a wee kit, a wee cub. Um, And he is of the lieutenants. He's always described as the one that's sort of like the most in touch with his animal side. He has a tragic backstory because of course he does. (laughs) That's like par for the course in the series. We've got tragic backstories everywhere which get, we get more into as the book goes along. But we open up with him actually like kind of on the prowl. He's detected this compound sort of on the fringes of changeling territory, and he can sense a female presence within it. And he's very intrigued by it. He can tell that it's psi related, but it's it's not the normal psi setup because of course not. Another theme I guess I should say of this entire series is and it's the new trope. It's not not like other girls. It's 
not like other Psy, because our main heroine in this book is Faith Nightstar, and she is not like other Psy. So Faith is what is called an F Psy, and F Psy's are, the F stands for foreseer, I believe, or yeah, foreseer, that sounds right. They are Psy that can see the future. They're rare within the race of Psy, and they are also incredibly valuable because since the inception of silence, their gifts have been completely trained to look for business predictions. So people pay a ton of money for these FSI to predict kind of the future of different business ventures. Um, the FSI are very valued within um, the Cynet as a whole because of that. But the kind of downside to this incredible gift is that they are very physically weak. So they tend to be, I think, I don't know if I've explicitly mentioned this before. One of the kind of quote unquote weaknesses of the Psy is that they tend to not be as physically strong as humans or changelings. Like they tend to be more, it's often described as delicate. Um, that's not always true. And, and they're, they definitely have like a armored like kind of like a fighting uh, group within them that we're actually going to talk more about in this particular book. But their fighting gifts are always focused on mental abilities, not necessarily physical abilities as often. So they're always sort of thought of as being a little bit weak, but the F Psy are the most delicate physically of any of the other Psy. And they have to be basically kind of like monitored, or at least that's what they're led to believe. So they will kind of get lost in their visions and forget to eat or sleep or take care of themselves. So they usually end up having these kind of caretakers around them that allow them to focus on their predictions, but then also make sure they like eat and stuff. So Faith Nightstar is one of these FSI. She's a cardinal and she is considered to be the most powerful FSI of her generation. Um, it says at 24, only 24 years of age, she'd already made more money than most Psy did in their entire lifetimes. But then again, she'd been working since she was three years old, since she'd found her voice. It had taken her longer than most children, but that was to be expected. She was a cardinal F Psy of extraordinary ability. It would have surprised no one if she had never spoken. So basically, uh, Night Star is the name of what is called her Psy Clan. And Psy Clans are kind of like a version of Hosen family group. So they do have actual, you know, they are like blood related but it's not in the same sort of patrilineal family associations we tend to think of in the real world. They all are blood related, but it doesn't necessarily have to be like parent to child always. Like sometimes they may have like distant cousins who are coming in and choosing to associate themselves as a part of that Psy clan. So Faith, I think her uh, birth last name was like Caracas, but she's changed it to Nightstar as an association with her Psy clan. And she is the one who is in this compound but at the beginning of the book, as is also true with Sasha, she's kind of at a pivoting point because she had started having these extremely dark visions, visions of, um, not of heat, though she does end up having those. We'll talk about that. I didn't mention that in Slave to Sensation. I should have, but these, these names of the books do relate to a major thematic um, kind of note in the book. But anyway, visions of heat will come later. Right now we're talking about like visions of blood, visions of death, visions of destruction. And she has been basically seeing and inhabiting kind of in the first person, a murderer. And it is really disturbing her because she specifically, her training is supposed to be that she's really only seeing things related to business. One thing that we learn, and I, I should mention this, in most of the books, there's these little like kind of prologues that will have some of the history of what's happened since silence was implemented. So you'll learn something about like a changeling war that happened, or you'll learn something else about psy culture. And in the beginning, um, in the prologue on this one, we get an indication that the FSI used to be one of their main things they would predict were um, like disasters or violence and they would help prevent them. But that's with silence that would it would often drive them mad, obviously, like if you were seeing such awful things. So part of silence is that they've been conditioned to not see those things anymore. And now Faith is seeing those things. So. We immediately have a pretty strong parallel here as to the setup Faith has in comparison to the setup that 
Sasha had. Both of them are at a breaking point. Both of them have like hit this sort of like decision tree of their life. And this book is basically going to be about them, uh, you know, making a decision that will drive them towards the arms of their fated mate. So in Faith's case, and again, I'm going to do my best not to get too in the weeds here because I could like literally... <laughs> I could literally sit here and just give you like a play by play of like, I thought this was interesting. And this is interesting. Like I'm looking at my notes, I have like 30 pages of notes. I'm going to try to hold myself back. But at a high level, what or a higher level, I should say, what happens is that Faith um, has heard about what's what happened with Sasha. She's also figured out over the course of her being in this sort of remote compound, how to get out of the compound without people seeing her. And she knows she's near Dark River territory. She could go talk to Sasha. And she realizes that there's nobody she can really trust, which is like a super sad realization. But she's like, well, I can't really trust anybody not to lie to me about what I'm seeing and what it means, either to not to lie to me or to not immediately send me to some sort of like reconditioning or locking me away even further um, so basically she doesn't have anybody she can trust to not to either tell her the truth or to not further take away her freedom. So she knows though that Sasha Duncan got out and she thinks, well, she wouldn't lie to me. <laughs> so maybe I can go to, you know, I have, there's another side I can go talk to, to try to figure out what I ought to do. So she decides to do this and Vaughn, who had been kind of looking at the compound anyway, because he'd been sort of drawn to it, uh, he, you know, kind of follows her as she leaves. There's an initial encounter where Vaughn sneaks up on her. They, you know, obviously have this immediate attraction, full, you know, surprising no one. Um, they have this immediate attraction, but he kind of tells her to stay there. He goes and gets Sasha and Lucas. And there's this like tense kind of exchange that happens initially where Vaughn is really pushing Faith. He's kind of needling her, but he's also incredibly drawn to her. He's incredibly um, disturbed by how much he wants to get a reaction out of her. And this all is, this is about roughly the first 25% of the book I'm describing right now. She also doesn't smell like a sigh. That was also something Sasha had. She didn't smell all metallic -y and stinky. She just smells good to him. We know there's something different about Faith. And by the 18% mark of this book, like very, very early on, we discover Vaughn is aware of the fact that he has some kind of intense draw to her that he has never felt for another woman. And his jaguar in particular wants to mark, claim, touch faith in a way that his animal has never wanted to do before. And as I mentioned, it's noted in the first book, but also in this book, that he is much more connected with his animal than most changelings tend to be. That obviously is kind of signaling to us as the reader, like, okay, from the jump, he kind of knows <laughs> This is going to be his mate. So they have kind of an exchange. And I think Sasha gives Faith some ideas about what might be going on and kind of giving her an indication of like, maybe you're meant to feel emotion. Like, maybe this is not actually as much of a problem as you think it is. So they have this like kind of initial exchange. Sasha and Lucas uh, go back to their house and they leave Vaughn and Faith in this cabin, which by the way, they've kind of blindfolded Faith so she can't see because they don't totally, you know, they're worried she might be some sort of like plant. Even though Sasha is pretty sure she's not, the dudes are very suspicious. And she has one of these dark visions while she's there. And Vaughn not only sees her have the vision, but he can sense a physical dark presence around her when it's happening. Uh, and he is, he is really the only thing that's been able to pull her out because part of what happens is she gets lost in it and she feels like she can't escape. But when he touches her, he's able to actually pull her out, teases her. He's like, should I kiss you? I've never kissed a side before. That might be fun. And that kind of snaps her out of her kind of fugue state. Um, it says her breath hitched and she shook her head against him like a kitten shaking off wet. He, she, so he's pushing her, but she's quickly learning to push back at him. So that's sort of the, the first, the first go round that they, that she has kind of leaving the compound. And she agrees that she's going to come back in about five days because she can get everyone to leave her alone for up to about three days at a time um, before people start like checking on her and trying to get a hold of her. 
And um, she's never really thought about it before, but when she goes back and they're kind of trying to get a hold of her earlier than she told them to try to get a hold of her, because she sort of set the expectation before she left, hey, I'm going to go under for three days and kind of like have a vision or whatever, you know, get back to me then. She realizes like, well, no, it's not just that they're trying to take care of me. They're, they're trying to control me. Basically, her experience or her sort of taste of freedom with the changelings recontextualizes how she's seeing the quote unquote care that the MSI in charge of her are and the rest of her clan have. It's like, well, no, you're trying to control me because I'm worth a shit ton of money to you. So she's kind of having this new perspective on kind of her, her scenario. I should pause here and also mention early on, we get a scene with the Psy Council. So if you will recall in the first book, uh, one of the Psy Council... <laughs> is uh, murdered and, and viciously torn apart because he was a serial killer and the changelings like sent little pieces of him to each of the remaining Psy counselors. Uh, it was incredibly graphic and violent and I'd forgotten that that had happened. Uh, so we're down from seven counselors to six at the beginning of this book and they are trying to decide who should be the next member of the Psy Council. And in that early scene, we find out that Faith is actually on the short list of, of potential candidates because she is such a powerful f -Sci. There is this force within the Psy net that I think we briefly hear about in the first book, but it's called the net mind. And the net mind is important in this book, but it's incredibly important for like all of the books going forward. Basically, the way I've always kind of visualized it is that the net mind is a collective consciousness that grows from the interconnected hive mind that is the cyanet. Sort of the visualization I've always had is, you know, in chemistry class, when you put a bunch of different like chemicals together, sometimes like that sort of solid sediment stuff will settle in at the bottom. And it's sort of like a product of the different chemical reactions that have happened. And it's separate from the solution now but it's inside of it and it's a product of it. That's kind of how I think about the net mind. So the net mind is its own consciousness within the Cynet. Um, and it is fed and created from all of the shared biofeedback between the Psy. And the net mind is an important part of what keeps the Cynet functioning. Um, we learn more and more about it as things go along, so I don't want to give too much away, but suffice it to say, it's an, a powerful force within the Cynet, and it is um, believed to be or supposed to be controlled by the Psy Council. And they found that the two designations that are best able to do that are the telekinetics, TK, or the Forseers, the f -Sci. So part of why Faith is being considered is that she is the most powerful f -Sci in the um, Cynet. Also, she's a cardinal, and it's thought that, you know, there needs to be another cardinal back on the council. So it's going to be either her, there's a MSI, I think, called Gia, who they're thinking of, and it's been a long time since an MSI has been on the council, so they think uh, politically it might be good to throw them a bone. And then the powerful TK Psy that they're considering is Caleb Krychek. And I mistakenly, I think in the last episode said he was already a counselor in the first book. I was wrong. I think I was forgetting about like maybe Marshall. Um, so uh, spoiler already, this whole thing is spoilery, but he ultimately becomes, <laughs> he ultimately takes over that seventh slot. But at the beginning of this book, we find out that it's either going to be him or Faith. And he is much more politically shrewd. He's kind of the way that we find or the way he's been discussed throughout the book and even in the beginning is that he's been sort of um eliminating rivals who might you know try to take a power away from him so he's very young just like uh faith is i think he's 27 she's 24 normally you aren't really considered for the psych council until you're like in your 30s ish but they are considering both of them because they're cardinals and because their particular designations are well suited to try to commune with the net mind and with the rise of the number of serial killers in the Cynet, they want to have a better control over the net mind so that they can kind of like, basically they, there's this sense of like, maybe they're not monitoring everything that's going on in the Cynet as well as they thought that they were. And so they want to make sure that they're um, sufficiently controlling the net mind and therefore sufficiently kind of keeping a hand on the pulse of what's going on in the Cynet writ large. So um, that's kind of the background consideration, too, is once Faith gets back, um, 
she starts kind of going out into the Cynet to learn more and kind of validate some of the things that Sasha and Vaughn and them were telling her. Uh, and she kind of is hearing whisperings about maybe it's going to be Caleb, like who's going to be the next side council member. Um, so she's doing some investigations there. What basically proceeds for a good, I'd say half the book, is that Vaughn keeps sneaking back to talk to her. He's figured out a way to infiltrate this compound. And they, you know, that's a theme throughout the books. They're always underestimating what, <laughs> what the changelings can do to sort of get around their different uh, protocols for security and whatnot, because they really do think of the changelings as animals. And so they don't give them enough credit for, you know, their ability to be sneaky or their ability to have, you know, tactical operations and whatnot. So he is sneaking in and their their connection is growing. He keeps pushing her. One thing is the Psy, uh, F-Psy, because they're so delicate, they really, even more so than other Psy, cannot tolerate physical touch. He's really pushing her boundaries on that which we will talk more about later because that is something that actually quite bothered me in this book. But he, so by the 40, I think I noted it was like at the 46% mark. Yeah, at the 46% mark, he has realized that she is his mate. Um, so not even halfway through this book, he is aware and we are aware that she is his mate. That's even earlier than when it happens in Slave to Sensation. So Again, the conflict here, it's interesting kind of how the timelines of the same types of conflict get allocated in this particular book. Because in the first book, we have this murder mystery, and then we have this like, are they going to get together plot. In this one, we have an are they going to get together plot kind of taking precedent over a little bit of the murder mystery bit. Oh, and I'm sorry, I totally forgot. <laughs> one of the main things that Faith went to talk to Sasha and them about is that she one of the things she she foresaw was that her sister Marine was going to be murdered. Sorry, that was like a huge thing. And I should have <laughs> explicitly said that I forgot. So that's part of what's really troubling her is that she foresaw her sister being murdered. She thought that it she couldn't she thought it must be a dream or just like a weird misfire. But then her father Anthony comes and tells her that her sister was in fact murdered. So, and part of what Sasha and them are telling her is like, look, it's probably a Psy. It's not, I don't think that this is a changeling or human from what you're describing. It's a Psy who killed her. That's why you saw it. And so that's part of what she is trying to validate. But that, you know, so that's sort of the pretext under which the plot gets going. But that really takes a back seat to her and Vaughn getting together for about half the book. So by the 46% mark, he knows that she's his mate. By the 53% mark, I noted... Um, Sasha and Lucas confront Vaughn and say like, hey, in our internal side network, the Web of Stars, which if you'll recall from the first book is Sasha, Lucas, their mating bond, and then all of Lucas's, you know, lieutenants who have taken a blood oath to him, they have this Web of Stars that is giving Sasha the biofeedback she needs. Well, they confront Vaughn and they're like, hey, we can see that you have a mating bond already to Faith. <laughs> so like, what are we going to do about this? And he basically says like, well, we got to figure out how to get her out of there. And the kind of tension or the different tension in this one is that there's a possibility because of the way their mating bond is working and the fact that Faith is not as precarious in her position in the Cynet as Sasha was. Like Sasha was like deteriorating and like falling apart. And Faith is not, she has moments of feeling like she might be, but she she isn't, it's not presented in the same way. And she has a much stronger connection to the Cynet itself. Like she can exist there more comfortably. So Vaughn is con con kind of confronted with this possibility pretty early on in the book that he may have this mate who doesn't ultimately actually choose to be with him. And so that's sort of where a lot of like kind of the angst factor is coming from. Then he finds out, he goes to see her because he's trying to plot of how he's going to get her out of there. And he sees Nikita, who if you'll remember is Sasha's mom, who is on the Psy Council, uh, talking with Faith. He overhears basically that they are considering Faith for the Psy Council. And he gets super mad. <laughs> he like, they get in this huge fight. And he's basically like, you have to choose. And like, you have to choose me. But even if you don't just know, like, basically, he kind of puts it out there of like, even if you didn't choose me, I will always choose you. So no matter what happens, I will come for you. It's very sweet and emotional. But she so Faith goes and has sort of like this interview with the Psy Council. And she has a very clear moment. She has a moment of clarity. Let me see if I can find it because I thought it was well 
well realized here. My notes didn't fully export, guys. I can't find it. Okay, well, I'm gonna be flying blind for the rest of this. Um, but basically, she has this moment when she's confronting, uh, when she's in with the council and, and having her interview with them, where she realizes, like, I could never be a part of this. Like, now that I know that they cover up for murderers, and like, now that I've really kind of confronted the realities of what it would mean to be fully silent and to be fully bought into the system, like, I can't do that. Like, I, I have to choose. I have to choose Vaughn in that connection. Um, even though at that point, she actually doesn't know how she'll be able to lead the Psy Net. She knows she has to, she has to reject um, being a part of the Psy Council. So she goes back. Uh, she does kind of have this moment of like, oh, I choose you. And he basically says like, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we have a way to get you out. Actually, sorry, before that happens, her father comes to visit her, Anthony. Uh, Caracas. And Anthony is the head of the Night Star clan. He's her biological father. And he tells her like, hey, look, um, I've been advised that Caleb Krychek is aware that you are his competition and that he is planning on eliminating you within the next two days. I think if we tell everyone that you are withdrawing your consideration, we'll be able to save you. But you're going to have to stay really low for at least the next three months. Like, you're not going to really be able to go into the sign net. You're going to have to be super locked down. And he basically says, like, well, you know, and she's like, well, but I, what if I want to do this? Or what if I, you know, I want to, I want that political prestige. And he's like, well, it's not worth it if we lose you. And she's like, I know I'm really valuable. And he's like, no, I've lost one daughter already this in the last month. I'm not going to lose another one. Which is, it, it's a different kind of note than we've heard from a Psy parent relationship before. And um, he, he basically says, like, you know, if, if what you're wanting is more connection, like, we can make that happen. So it's kind of an interesting little note. But right after that, she and Vaughn have their big dramatic scene where they choose each other. And then they go get it on. Um and, you know, that's very steamy and whatever. And at the end of that, she finally fully accepts kind of their mating connection. She sees the the mating bond. She chooses it. And um, and so that is locked in place and she is able to drop out of the signet. So that happens actually, I think, at like the 75 percent ish mark. So it's a di- it is a slightly different conflict or kind of book structure than the first one had, because it's not sort of the climax, her dropping out of the signet. It's sort of the secondary climax, because after that, we kind of resume our killer plot again. So she, um, working with Judd Lauren, who we met in the first book, who uh, is a part of the wolf pack, even though he is a psi and he's kind of dropped out. We see her uh, kind of helping to track that killer down. Um, another thing that's been happening kind of in the background is that she spends a lot of time, uh, or not a lot of time, but she spends a good chunk of the book talking to the net mind. She makes connection with the net mind, and we come to realize that it really is sort of like a child. It communicates in these different images. And even after she leaves the psi net, it's able to talk to her, it's able to connect with her. Um, It can't join their network, but it can still talk with her. So we kind of get some foreshadowing that she's going to continue to be an important part of managing the net mind even while she's out of the signet. And another thing that the net mind reveals is that there is this kind of splitting of its own person that has happened and there is the net mind who is good and like has has emotion a but also has positive emotions which is something that's kind of unexpected it's very like childlike joyful um and it has split within itself and it has divided into this secondary consciousness that nobody knew or like i guess maybe some people but it's not widely known that there is a second consciousness within the signet and that is called the dark mind And that is where basically we get an allusion to this is what is causing Faith to have all of these awful visions, these dark visions. And that is what is driving these kind of like serial killers in the sign not to do what they're doing. So that's kind of a big setup for future books. Um, Faith also has a prediction towards the end of the book where she sees that there's going to be a collapse at the wolves caves and they warn them uh, and they find kind of where there was this big structural foundation and she saves, I think it's like seven pups, seven wolf pups from being killed. And so, you know, that's kind of a further cementing of, okay, her destiny now is going to be using this for, for good, not for evil. 
Um, the Psy Council tries to come and eliminate her. Um, they send, I think, like six or seven assassins onto the Dark River territory and Vaughn destroys them and then takes their bodies and leaves them on council members' doorstep. So very clear message to leave Faith alone. And we get a reconvening scene of the Psy Council with its seventh member, who is now Caleb Krychek. And he advises, along with some other people, like, hey, we're going to leave the Night Stars alone because uh, Faith gets called in from her dad um, and they come to an alliance uh, where Faith is going to continue to work for the Night Star group, but she's going to do it essentially as a subcontractor. So um, she's still aligning with them. And in that meeting, it's actually very touching because Anthony, I mean, he doesn't show his emotion, but he basically says, like, I, you know, you're my daughter and like, I'm going to take care of you, even if you're not in the Synet. And I am not going to let the Psy Council get rid of you. Like, we are a powerful family and like, we are going to basically throw our dicks around and nobody's going to mess with you. And I still want to be a part of your life. And he says in a very emotionless way, but what he's saying is something that Sai should not be able to really say. And so she impl- she basically is like, well, do you like how how are you so silent then? How do you put up with this? And he basically says, like, look, if no if nobody is left in the Sinet who will try to keep things going or change things, what will happen? Uh, so it's cl- he basically makes it clear that it's been offered to him in the past to be on the Psy Council, but he doesn't want to do that. He wants to be a countervailing force against it so that he can try to, to um, you know, stop the bleeding, so to speak, of the mess that the Synet is getting in. And he basically says, well, you know, where do you think you got your conscience from? Where do you think you... So he's emotionless, but the things he is saying to her are very emotional. And it's actually really touching. I find it very sweet. And Vaughn also says when they leave, like, hey, he doesn't stink either. Like, he doesn't stink the way that neither you nor Sasha stunk when I met met you guys. So, like... He basically what we take from that is that Anthony actually really does have Faith's back and he's going to do whatever he has to do to take care of her. Um, And I think that's more or less where we kind of leave off. I'm trying to think if there's any other big kind of foreshadowing moments. We do hear about some other characters we'll know we'll hear more about in the future. One is um, Faith has a few relatives who have disappeared over the years, um, including somebody named Sahara. So that becomes something that will come back up later. Um, We find out that she has a vision where she sees that Dorian, who's one of the lieutenants in Dark River, he's a latent leopard, meaning that his leopard uh, changeling form has never happened. So he has all of the same abilities as the other changelings do in his physical, in his human form, but he's never been able to change into um, a leopard. And she kind of has a vision of him being able to do that, of him being fully emotionally kind of made whole again. Uh, we have a vision of, of that. So I think that's most of the plot things I wanted to talk about. Now let's get into, we'll dig into some of these plot points and things that didn't, didn't work for me, um, as well as some of the big themes. Okay. Starting just from sort of like a place of critique. I think that this book doesn't have the same sort of just propulsiveness that the first one did. Because in the first book, we find out the solution to how Psy can leave the Synet. That's what the big tension in the first one is, is like, oh my gosh, how can, how can Sasha leave the Synet? Like, what's going to happen? And because Vaughn is, is very clearly Faith's mate from the jump, like we, the readers, know that. And we've seen in the previous book how she can leave the Synet and not die I think that that just really undercuts a lot of the narrative tension that existed in the first book. I also think the murder plot elements of this one feel much more secondary and kind of just slotted in. Um, And so all in all, my kind of assessment of this book is that it's a good book. It's better than most kind of like speculative or paranormal romances you're going to read. Like it is high quality But I think it is markedly not as good as the first one and it's not as good as the next one we're going to read because there's just so much less tension since it's such a similar conflict to the one before it. And we already know the answer as to how that conflict gets resolved. So I actually think that if this had been a novella, it would have been a lot more effective 
And I say that in part because Nalini Singh is a fantastic writer of novellas. Her, some of the novellas in the series I absolutely adore. So I think that probably this could have been streamlined, turned into a novella, and have been a better story. So I, in terms of just sort of why I don't think this one worked as well for me as the first one, that's kind of what I think is going on. There are a couple of other things in this that bother me or... <sighs> Uh, that I was conflicted about. So first of all, there is, so this book was written in 2007. I wonder how this book would have been written and or received if it had been originally published today, because it is very jarring how much Vaughn, especially in the first, I'm going to say like 40%, is insisting on touching Faith and Faith is consistently saying, No, don't touch me. I psychically cannot handle touch. It will break me. It will make me insane. And yet he continues to force touch on her. Like he continues to push that on her. And in terms of what is happening in the world or in the narrative, we're very much in his perspective. And his perspective is his his jaguar is telling him. She needs to be touched so that she basically can become adapted to it and then leave leave the sign at like not that explicitly at first, but like his Jaguar is giving him a very strong intuition that part of what she needs is touch. Even that's what she's been taught to think she can't have. There's also this strong motif, I guess we could call it throughout this of he is even because he is even more in touch with his animal, he has a particular need for touch and sort of like the uh, it's established in the first book that there's some level of sort of like biofeedback that changelings get from that. And he has a stronger need for that than most. So in the narrative, it is not portrayed or it's I, I think that the author's attitude is not that he is assaulting her in any way like that is clearly not the way we as the readers are meant to perceive it however I think in a post me too world it's just impossible for me to read it as anything but a man touching a woman who is consistently saying she does not want him to do that it takes me out of the story and it just introduces a dynamic that I am very confident the author did not intend to introduce but I just think it's present um, for readers today. And I think if this, I, I would love to find out more about like, if this was being written today, would it be written in the same way? I think the answer is no, because I think it just reads in a way that probably it didn't to the original readers. Now it should, I mean, you know, consent has always been consent. It's not like that's actually a new thing, but I, you know, I think that's part of living in a, a society that's always progressing is that we deepen and nuance our understanding of ways that there are microaggressions and just flat out aggressions perpetrated against marginalized communities all the time. So like, I just think that we have deepened our understanding and we have arrived at a more vociferous societal consensus that like, hey, Yes means yes. It's not just no means no. Yes means yes. So that did consistently kind of pull me out of the book. Something else um, that I think it, it occurred to me several times throughout this book. And now that I'm rereading it, I do think that the author intends for us to question this based on some of the kind of comments that get made throughout is... There's this idea that silence means the sigh have no emotions. And I mean, that's how I've described it to you guys sort of in the setup. You know, that's sort of the official party line. But what do they mean by emotion? Like, how do they define it? Because they seem to be very comfortable with things like ambition and greed and arrogance and kind of like a thirst for power. So I think that definitely there is some tension being introduced purposefully into the narrative that the Psy think that they have quote unquote no emotions, what they've actually done is just killed all positive emotions and what they perceive as the most damaging, extreme negative emotions. And they're allowing other negative emotions to just go. So I think I just hadn't quite picked up on that until this book, but I definitely think that's something that the author is intending to problematize. Um, one thing I noticed is as Faith is transitioning from 
perceiving herself as being emotionless to being somebody who has emotions, she'll start saying, I prefer, and then she'll pause and correct herself and say, I like something. And prefer is ostensibly a less, I guess, sort of like emotional, like emotive verb there. But both of them actually mean the same thing. It's just sort of the emotional con like kind of contours around it. And I think that that's maybe what the author is wanting or the text or however you want to put it. I think that's where the book is pushing us of the side do still have emotions in a lot of ways. They just don't have emotions on as extreme of a level, or I guess they just don't have certain emotions to the same extent that they used to. And they talk to themselves about emotions in a way that they think is emotionless. Does that make sense? Like, it's like the way that they their internal narrative about emotions to themselves is purposefully meant to be deadened, but it's still there. They still have preferences. They still want things. And that implies a level of some kind of emotion. So I hadn't quite picked up on that, but I'm going to keep my eye out going forward. Um, something else, this was true in the last book a little bit. We saw the theme of a loss of a sister with Dorian because his sister... Kylie was um, killed by Enrique. And also um, we see the wolf pack. There is a woman who's taken and we see her brothers um, being very impacted by the kind of capturing of their sister and then the return. And we see that again. That's another strong motif in this one, because as I mentioned, Faith's sister was murdered at the beginning of this one. And she, a lot of her kind of growth is coming from her reckoning with her feeling of guilt about her sister's death, that she s foresaw that it was going to happen, but because she didn't trust that emotional side of herself, she didn't do anything to stop it. And then we Vaughn's tragic backstory, because, you know, as I said, everybody's got a tragic backstory in this book, in this world. Um, his tragic backstory is that his parents, who are changelings, became a part of a religious fanatical cult, and they were persuaded to take he and his sister into the forest and basically abandon them. And his sister was younger than him. And um, she ended up starving to death before he could get her help. And so he feels very conflicted about that. So loss of sisters or like sisters in peril is something we see a lot in this series. And in this book in particular, they're connecting over the fact that both of them have lost a sister and both of them feel guilt about that sister's death. Um so anyway, I, I that's particularly a micro kind of connection point in this book. But let's keep our eyes, you know, be be wary of or be afraid for all uh, beloved sisters in this series going forward, because they they seem to um, have a lot of bad endings or there seems to be a lot of complicated relationships there. So those were some of the things I was noticing. Another thing, uh, another kind of theme here is uh the idea that physical touch can overwhelm your mental abilities or your mental capabilities. And I, I think that there's this idea um, in the Psy in particular that the mental really is superior to the physical or that the mental is in some sense more real than the physical. But we see over and over again that the physical is as important and as um like it's more, it's as if not more real than what you think. So I guess the, the what I want to, where I'm going with that is that for one thing, we see in this book that a physical reality can impact a, a mental reality. So when Faith is being attacked by the dark mind and she has this, like I said earlier, Vaughn can literally sense like a dark presence around her. He's able to basically attack that presence as if it were a physical attacker on faith. He like covers her with his body and like pull, pull, has his claws out and the darkness recedes. So we see that. We also see um, throughout the series, the animal sides of the changeling and their intuition is treated almost as being infallible. Like not perfectly, but the intuition of the kind of beast within and that beast is I think meant to be a metaphor for our sort of more primal physical side is is seen as being basically always right and part of what happens when a um sometimes changelings go mad and they go what's called rogue um 
that is seen as like such an aberration and seen as such just sort of like a betrayal of their fundamental nature. And I think it's because in general, we the reader are meant to really trust the animal sides of these changelings. Like usually in these books, whatever the, the animal side says, you can trust is the right instinct. So I do think that there's a real like kind of championing of the physical over the mental. And I, you know, this, well, I guess this will touch on another thing, the kind of last big heavy thing I want to talk about. But I think that's a very interesting kind of philosophical take. I mean, if you've studied the history of philosophy, there's so, you know, (laughs) there's volumes upon volumes about like, what is the nature of the physical versus the mental, like, you know, different traditions or philosophical ideas having sort of like a more dualistic perception of the spirit versus the physical and sort of the spirit being superior. Like there's a long, there's a long history of human thought of how to reconcile our interiority with our physical reality. And the fact that this book, I think, or this series rather consistently seems to be telling us to not discount our physicality, I think is a really interesting thematic kind of statement. Um, So that really struck me in this particular one. Two other motifs before we get to the heavy metaphor and my sort of like revelation I had. Um, One is that the hair motif from the first book I think is back. So we once again see um, this idea of uh, kind of touching hair or touching fur um, as a way of sort of communicating intimacy and communicating sort of the the lowering of of barriers or shields between the lovers. Um, Particularly in this one, we see Faith touching Vaughn's hair a lot. He's sort of described as this sort of like, (laughs) he kind of sounds like a surfer dude. He has like long long blonde hair and he's like very tanned. Um, So he's constant, you know, she, she has many significant moments where she's touching his hair or when he's in his animal form, rubbing his fur. She has this vibrant red hair that he's, you know, he actually gives her her nickname red from, from her hair. And then he's also constantly playing with it. So hair is like a big thing in side changeling world. And then, uh, we also get a lot of repetitions of, um, faith using the verb play as a way to communicate her understanding of the sort of playful animal nature and sort of the interactions that the changelings have, um, it's kind of in the same line of when they talk about skin privileges or different kinds of pack interactions. She she uses the word play for that a lot. And that kind of takes on this emotional freight between them throughout the book. So I noted that that was just a, a word that got repeated a lot. And now we come to the the thing that I've been putting off because I'm like, oh, God, how, do, how much do I really want to get into this? But the, the kind of revelation I had was that, and this is going to get personal, uh, I guess a, a mild content warning for emotional or spiritual abuse. And um, I also just want to disclaim, this is my experience. I very much believe like if some of the things I'm talking about are a system that work for you and you've engaged with like some of the problems and the structures of these systems, uh, you know, I completely believe there's ways to be still in these groups um, in a way that has like, you know, real integrity. For me, these groups did not work and were very destructive. Um, So I'm just saying I'm not trying to yuck your yum, I guess, but I'm also just trying to speak my truth. So um, I was a part of fundamentalistic evangelical Christian religion for, I guess you could say like from age like roughly six to roughly age 27 or eight. Um, I ended up going to grad, I'm, I'm in kind of IT and business for my profession, but I ended up going to grad school and getting a master's in like religion and sort of the theology of Christian art because I was in, well, I didn't realize that at the time, but like a spiritual crisis and I was trying to figure out what the heck is going on. So I, I took time out to do that. And through that, Um, not at the time, but in the, in kind of the years since. And, and I think frankly, the fact that I graduated and came back to America from Canada, right in the middle of the Trump candidacy and seeing kind of what that did to churches and how they responded to that ended up pretty dramatically deconstructing out of that faith. And I read this book for the first time when I was in the middle of that process. 
And I now think that a huge part of why I connected so deeply with this series, and particularly with the Psy characters in this series, is that I think if one chooses to, to see it this way, I think you could certainly see the Cyanet as a metaphor for a very controlling version of a religion, belief system, or even a cult. Because so much of what the Cyanet is about is thought control. What you can and can't think about, what you can and can't show the other people in your in-group, or else you will be reconditioned, um, or you will be uh, expelled from the group. And this idea of like shutting down a specific kind of emotion, as I was talking about earlier, really the side do still have certain kinds of emotion, um, but, but specific kinds of emotion are verboten. And so seeing the sign at, through that lens, oh my gosh, like this really <laughs> just hit me in the feels and really sent me back. And I, I was going and looking through my journals, um, of kind of what I was processing and thinking at the time I first read these books. And it's, I, just it's exactly why I must have been connecting so much with them because I that was very much my experience of thought control always feeling like I was bad or going crazy as we were talking about in the last book because you know I I just felt so disconnected from my true self versus what I was told I had to think or else I would literally you know, spend eternity in a fiery pit. You know what I mean? Like, so there's this constant confliction between both who I am as a person and kind of like some of my core, like how I truly felt about other people, you know, like being told you have to think this about people who are gay or that you have to have this specific kind of political worldview. You have to have this, you have to have that. And, um, just constantly being told that and, and frankly being told like, well, apart from this very specific flavor of Christianity, nobody else is saved and everybody else is bad. And then going into the world and this is, you know, the, you know, we see Faith and Sasha and them meeting these changelings who really change their perspective of um, what's actually out there. And for me, it was, you know, connecting more and more with people who are outside of that religious bubble and realizing like, these are great people. <laughs> These are people who would, you know, give me whatever off the, you know, give me the shirt off their back if they needed to. Or these are people in my workplace who are willing to like put their name on the line so that I have opportunities. And these are people who, you know, are doing good for the world in this sphere. And really having that, you know, basically the cognitive dissonance, and I'm somebody who already has a very low tolerance for cognitive dissonance, that that constantly put me in was a huge part of why I felt like I was going crazy. And when I finally, you know, deconstructed and allowed myself, you know, kind of my mantra coming out of grad school was like, okay, all truth is God's truth. If it's true, I don't have to be afraid of this. And see, and just letting that take me where it would, that, that was the path to freedom. So anyway, for me, sorry to get personal and maybe a little deep, and I'm sure that was offensive to some people, and I, I did not intend it that way. That's just me being honest about my experience. But I I really think that that is a strong possible reading for what's going on with the Psy. I think underscored more even in this book when Vaughn has this sort of um, explicit religious element that gets introduced uh, through what happened with his parents. And often in these books, when we're talking about like, for instance, the group who came up with the idea of silence, they are couched in terms of being almost sort of like religious extremists. So I definitely think that is a possible rating for these books. And I think it's one that subconsciously I had at the time. And now that I've identified it, um, really resonate with. I was uh, I started listening to a podcast called um, Dirty Rotten Church Kids. And I was listening to that while I was reading this kind of in the same time window. And I, I think that's part of what helped me make the connection. But yeah, I mean, I, I think I really related to it. Also, I mean, just to be totally candid, even just um, kind of the sexual awakening for me coming much later in my life, because you know, I, I was a good fundamentalist evangelical gal um, and, you know, didn't start exploring that stuff until much later than most of my peers because I just, it was so, I was told to be so cut off from that sort of um, what I now view as just like natural, normal part of being a human. 
Um, and so I really also, I think, connect with these books in that sense with these side characters who have <laughs> later in life sort of sexual awakenings because um, I, I certainly I certainly can relate to that as well. So anyway, that's the end of the personal uh, corner and also the end of me, I'm sure, making a lot of people very uncomfortable or mad at me. And again, I, I am not meaning to attack. I'm just meaning to be frank about my own experiences. So... That was that lovely <laughs> section. We'll see how much of that I keep in. Um, and so then we'll go ahead and move on to ratings to start to wrap things up. So first of all, last time we talked about uh, my rating for cozy community vibes. This time I'm only going to give this three out of 10 uh, shielding practicing sessions for cozy community vibes. I don't think there's nearly as much sort of like pack dynamics in this one. We get a couple like, you know, some a few solid moments, but this one is much more insular, which Makes sense because Faith herself, um, she kind of even talks about this with Vaughn at the end of the book. She's like, I'm never going to love being around a lot of people. Is that going to be okay with you? And he, you know, totally accepts that about her. But that does mean it tends to be a lot of just the two of them or even just each of them one on one because he's also sort of a loner. So, you know, that checks out for him, too. But anyway, so less cozy community vibes here. I would also say this one isn't as spicy as the last one. So I'm going to give this six out of 10 naked daydreams. One of the um, early kind of parts of their mating dance is that uh, she hasn't realized that they have a bond. Like he's the one who realizes it before she does. And he starts exploiting it by having very X-rated um, <laughs> daydreams about her and sending her that through their mental link. And she sort of, you know, She's like pushing back on him uh, through their bond of like, knock that off. Um, so there is some steaminess here. I don't think quite as much as the last one, but I, I would give it six out of 10 naked daydreams. Um, for political machinations, I am going to give this one eight out of 10 new side council members. Um, and actually, maybe should I bump that up? I'll leave it. I guess I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, I think eight is right. This one does have a lot of political intrigue in it. I'd say as much as the last one. I think I gave the last one eight as well. So yeah, there is a lot of, um, you know, obviously they're trying to fill a, a slot on the side council. So there's going to be a lot of kind of political machination discussions. Um, and I, I thought that that was definitely a big element of the plot in this one. And then in terms of the angst, I'm only going to give this four out of 10 sculptures for your one true love. Uh, he does have Vaughn in his surfer blonde hair. I just, I'm picturing him as such like a dude bro. I don't know why. Um, he also is a uh, poet in his heart, I guess. And he is sculpting uh, a beautiful image of faith. Uh, so that that's why I named it for that. It does have some angst in this because there is this conflict introduced of like, oh, what if she, you know, he's connected to this Psy who may choose not to complete the mating dance and sort of we get this inside of like, okay, mating, once the mating dance is initiated or like once sort of the animal, like your changeling side has chosen your mate, like it's kind of done. Uh, you only get one shot at that. So if she doesn't check him, then he's kind of SOL. So um, there's a little bit of angst introduced there. There's moments of, of that kind of pathos, but it's not nearly as big of a part of this book. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, I just think that the tension in this one isn't nearly as high. So overall, I did enjoy this book. I would give it three and a half out of five stars, which for me is like kind of a B plus type thing. I do think this would have been stronger as a novella, but it was still super enjoyable. And yeah, we're marching along. So it was I think I like this one better on this reread a little bit. I think I gave it three stars originally. And now I would I would give it three and a half with the benefit of hindsight. So I think that we can start to wrap up this episode. So if you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment to rate and review the show, as well as share it with your fellow speculative romance loving friends. If you want to hear more from me, you can follow me at Books Like Woe on YouTube and Instagram, Goodreads, Twitter, all those things. Uh, thanks for listening. And we will be back next time to talk about one of the very best and most beloved books in this entire series, which is Pressed by Ice. And we will be joined by one of my best bookish gal pals, Bethany from Beautifully Bookish Bethany. So tune back in in two weeks for that. And thanks so much for listening. Bye!